Hello, everyone. We're back. I'm David Hamilton, founder and chairman of the America's Future Series. And I'm thrilled to be here with Jan Yekulik of Epic Times and Brigadier General Robert Spaulding. Uh, they're going to have a fascinating conversation about uh, a documentary they made, et cetera, called The Final War. I want to play a little clip of that. I will, uh, let's intro that so people have a sense of what that's like. And then we're going to come back and Jan and uh, uh, General Spaulding will have a fantastic conversation. The American people are standing on the edge of a cliff. I'm a father. Like every dad, I want to see my kids grow and prosper. And I'm afraid for their future. Oh, yeah. This is the most ambitious regime in history. The greatest threat facing the United States is the CCP. Sooner or later, we are going to defeat America. The goal and the objective for this World War III scenario for the Chinese Communist Party is to defeat the democratic system. The Wuhan virus gave China a good opportunity. Yes, we're in World War III now. But it's a third world war that the United States and the rest of the free world has never been prepared for. We are in a world war with the Chinese Communist Party without realizing it. When you're losing a war and you don't even know you're in it, it's hard to get worse than that. We have to become comfortable with the term warfare under our own roofs in our companies. Confronting the CCP is the final war. They have been systematically working since the day they took power in China to confront their number one enemy, the American government. I thought it was a joke. I never thought it could become true. No. It is terrible that CCP has gotten so far along in this 100-year plan, but they've gotten really close to succeeding. The Epic Times investigation team had studied the CCP for years. But this time, what we uncovered was yielding evidence beyond our imagination. Hide our strength and bide our time. When they tell you they are weak, that's when you watch out. Deng Xiaoping made it very clear. The reason we open our door, open our market to the U.S., just we want their money. Take their money, take their technology, and get rid of them when they get the first opportunity. In 2001, Jiang ratcheted up the budget to purchase Russian weapons. The new Chinese military is the only one being developed anywhere in the world today that is specifically configured to fight the United States of America. People Liberation Army has been very actively working on bioweapon programs. We are capable of achieving our goal of cleaning up America in the blink of an eye. China's strategic goal is to make sure that the U.S. has four enemies, and one of them must be a terrorist group. Russia is like one, but it's not enough. In front of the United States, it's a tiger. He wants to eat you. With Chairman Mao, with the Prime Minister, our talks have been characterized by frankness. The Clinton administration said, oh, don't worry about it. This will be a poison pill for China. Well-intentioned American presidents and other leaders have been duped by them. We face the prospect of becoming a U.S. system with Chinese characteristics in the not too distant future.
destroying the free world and your life, your happiness, and your children's future. And a new generation of Americans will be trained to obey the CCP. We must live, you must die. This is straight out of the communist playbook. We are giving of our life's blood so that the Chinese Communist Party can survive and thrive. Great to be back with you again. Well, General Spalding, it's always good to speak with you. Typically, we talk on American thought leaders. You're one of the few regular guests that, that I always invite back. And, you know, I want to mention just very briefly uh, that we're very happy to be partnering here with the America's Future Summit. This has been a great partnership. We're live streaming it on um on the Epoch Times website as we speak and via our other channels. Uh, so General Spalding, I have to ask you this. Uh, the, 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 why is it now or never? That is the final moment of that trailer. I know you were watching it. Um, I recently had an interview with uh, uh, General Kellogg. General Kellogg mentioned that the US now is only positioned officially to fight 1.5 wars or 1.5 adversaries. I forget how he said it. Um, meanwhile, you know, in this documentary, in the final war where you're featured, it says now or never. Is it indeed now or never? And why is that? Well, I think the, the whole point of the idea of the final war is that um, if you remember after the end of the Cold War, Francis Fukuyama says, you know, it's the end of history, meaning, you know, democracy has prevailed. There's no more um, there's no more authoritarians to fight. And I think what what happened was that that wasn't the case. And in, in fact, the authoritarians had studied the Cold War, in this case, the Chinese Communist Party, learned the lessons of the Soviet Union, what not to do. And, you know, because we had we had come into this world as a, as a lone superpower, we felt very um, safe in admitting these authoritarians into the world system. And so a world that was very much isolating uh, these systems now all of a sudden flipped to being absolutely open to any and all comers. So globalization and the internet as identified by these two PLA colonels that wrote Unrestricted Warfare back in 1997, ended up being the mechanism for this new type of war. So the final war is not a war in the sense that General Kellogg's thinking or talking about, which is more military in, in essence. What this is about is a war on our ideals, on the, I, the very uh, ideals of liberal dem uh, democracy, you know, uh, free trade, rule of law, uh, human rights, civil liberties. These are things that uh, are under assault every single day, but it's, they're not under assault by tanks. And that's the key. They're under assault through you know, social media, through economic and financial relationships with U.S. corporations and financial institutions. It's a different kind of war. And it's more importantly, it's being very effective. In, in other words, they're winning. You know, authoritarianism around the world is on the march, especially as we saw during the coronavirus in terms of how governments began to treat their, their citizens. And so I think that's the key. The final war is really about the, the authoritarians having learned their lesson, what doesn't work against democracies and adopted the principles, quite frankly, that that are working. We're very focused on Russia right now. Right. And the Russia Ukraine war in that context, very specifically. Um, what about China? What about Taiwan? Well, um, I lost you a little bit there, but uh, if you're asking about China and Taiwan, uh, I believe that the Chinese are going to invade. And, you know, we don't know when that's going to come. I believe that it's it's a matter of what timing do they choose to make that happen? You know, we didn't know that, uh, you know, the Soviet Union was going to roll tanks in Czechos Czechoslovakia in the, in the 1960s, but they did. And I think, you know, there was a lot of people that said Putin is definitely not going to invade Ukraine. I, of course, I was not one of them. But, you know, so 
where there's a lot of people saying that the Chinese are not going to invade it in Taiwan because it wouldn't make sense. Well, you know, authoritarians do things that don't make sense. Hitler opened up two fronts in Europe. Uh, the Japanese bombed uh, Pearl, Pearl Harbor. So this is something that authoritarians do. And the problem is that most people don't understand that China is an authoritarian system. In fact, my son, you know, texted me one time. He was a senior in college and he said, Dad, my my teacher just told me that China's a democracy. Was, well, if China's a democracy, then I'm a bird. No, absolutely. And this is a, a key point, and this is something that you've brought out in Stealth War and is very much uh, highlighted in the film The Final War, is that information warfare is such an incredibly important tool of this battle. So why don't I just jump in here and talk a little bit about TikTok, right? T right now, there's a lot of buzz here in, in the building behind me in the Capitol about TikTok, about banning TikTok, about how TikTok is a weapon actually of the Chinese regime, or at least functions as one, much as the CCP has weaponized, for example, finances and gotten US corporations to finance its own growth, which is another topic which you highlight in the final war. So what, tell me, what about TikTok? Is this something that uh, is a real threat? Well, I think the, the one thing that everybody talks about is they're taking, uh, you know, citizens data and they are you know, compiling digital dossiers on literally everyone. That's one of that's only one of the ways that TikTok is being used. One of the major ways uh, that it's being used, and it's just not just in America and other countries outside of China, is as a way to reduce productivity in those nations. So, for example, in China, this this uh, this app Douyin, which is the uh, Chinese language corollary to TikTok, the Chinese Communist Party says that kids cannot be on it for 40, 40, uh, more than 40 minutes a day. So the, the app actually prevents them from being on it more than 40 minutes a day. And so in the West, you know, nearly every other country except for like India, who banned it, uh, you, you can be on watching videos for hours and, and bite dances. Uh, algorithms are designed to, you know, get you hooked to watching videos because, you know, your brain reduces um, uh, or, or uh, you know, sends out dopamine. So it's it's kind of like being on crack cocaine uh, for your brain. And that and so people tend to watch hours and hours of it. So it's driving down productivity outside of China. Now, what kind of video and content is being on uh, TikTok and Douyin? In Douyin, so if you ask a kid in China that's, that's using the app Douyin, what do you want to be when you grow up? They'll say, I want to be an astronaut. So they have engineering classes on there. They have these videos that are educational, but and they're also you know you, patriotic. So they're getting you to be a better citizen, to be more knowledgeable, be more productive. And then in the West, you know, if you ask a kid you know, that's on TikTok a lot, what do they want to be? It's a social media influencer. So it's not just about taking data. It's also about reducing productivity. And then the final piece is that the Chinese Communist Party is inserting messages into TikTok that basically gets people to say, oh, this system that China has built is actually a better system than liberal democracy. In fact, liberal democracy is old news. And in fact, we, what we want is a government that has total control over the population. And then by giving up total control, the government will ensure that you're safe and secure and you have a job. And that is a system that you know China is trying to convince the world is a better system. And so they it, but it doesn't just stop at TikTok. They're on Twitter. They're on Facebook. They're on all their platforms and all of ours. I just also want to highlight that basically it's, for example, these uh, social media apps, right? And this was cataloged very well in The Social Dilemma, which didn't talk about TikTok. It talked about, um, you know, Facebook and some others. They know more about us from, you know, basically tracking everything they possibly can through our phones than we know about ourselves in many ways, right? So you can imagine a situation where someone, you know, the, the app flags that someone has a particular sort of, for example, mental instability or, or a proclivity to revolutionary behavior or whatever it is that you can imagine, you know, in the, under the control of an, an adversary. And this is another thing actually I wanna get you to comment on. We keep saying strategic competitor. Why aren't we saying enemy? You know, you basically you could send programming to people like that to basically make them more unstable and make their lives more difficult very, very easily if you had that kind of control. 
Right. And so that's getting to to kind of the thing that they're talking about today on DC, which is this ability to get your data. So that comes from ad data from software development kits uh, for the apps on smartphones. So this this information that's collected about you, uh, particularly for apps like TikTok, it's just about everything uh, that that every sensor on that device um, is all that information is being sent back. And then that's being uh, used to feed you ads that can also be used to, to, as you mentioned, feed you other directly to you other information. But think of it also in terms of just the danger to um, to the U.S. or to corporations. So say you're a J.P. Morgan executive. So guess what? You know, the, somebody can track you who you're talking to. So through those interactions, all you need to do is provide that data to an Intel analyst and let them spend a few um, you know, hours looking at your data and see what you're doing. And you can pr uh, present a pr fairly good picture of what that person is doing. So it's a competitive intelligence problem for business, but it's an absolute national security nightmare if you're talking about you know, the, the White House, because you know, the same thing happens in the White House. Who's going to the White House today? Who are they meeting? What are they talking about? These are the things that you can gather from this or the Hill or the Pentagon. All it's happening every single day because I see it, you know, in my business. And so I think that's the thing that people don't re recognize. We have built this very open data environment um, on free apps and free, you know, this and free that. Well, it's not free. And what what is what the, the cost to the country is in this ability to leverage your data for nearly every anything that you want to include, as you mentioned, the ability to directly influence the individual on that smartphone as they interact with applications. So this is a, you know, very kind of intractable problem that I'm thinking about here right now. And this is that, you know, we had just had testimony on the Hill uh, yesterday about how, you know, this concept of combating disinformation, which clearly is something that the Chinese Communist Party is extensively involved in vis-a-vis -vis America, right? But in the name of countering disinformation, you know, social media in America, even in collaboration with government as it's been exposed and, and so forth, have actually censored inc truthful, incredibly valuable information, incredibly important information in the name of fighting disinformation. On the other hand, this disinformation is a very real thing and very, very destructive. And so, so I, I'm struggling with how do we grapple with this? Because as we've been saying, this information war, or the, the use of propaganda and information is becoming a more and more dominant part of actual warfare. Right. Well, I mean, so there's a couple of challenges here. One is the open data system that I already mentioned. So your data can be, you know, uh, bought in on the open market through hundreds of different um hundreds of different um, application vendors. So you can buy that data. So you can use that data as we talked about to manipulate the individual. But here's the other problem. The other problem is that we've had enormous corporate consolidation of economic power in the country over the last 30 to 40 years. So now you have overall holding companies owning you know, companies like Pfizer and CBS. Now, when you have the intermixing of corporate America uh, and the media, then you have the ability for financial institutions to influence the media in ways that support the corporate business model. And so if you have a business that says, hey, we need to make sure that you know, people aren't you know, afraid of a vaccine, and, you ha and it just so happens that the government actually believes that that's something that the, the population needs. You have all the mechanism now to make that happen, to create this one world narrative. And oh, by the way, the challenge for you know protecting our republic is the fact that the way China chose to fight this, you know, this second or third world war, if you want to call it that, or Cold War, however you want to mention it, second Cold War, the way they sought to to fight that is embed themselves in those same relationships. So now you have China, now you have the corporations that support the, 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 the pharmaceutical manufacturers, and you have the media all basically working together through financial relationships. This is a, a terribly um, dangerous cocktail. As we've seen throughout our history, we know that there are times when economic consolidation leads to abuses. One of the ones that's, that's very famous is the Gilded Age. Remember the robber barons? Everybody knows that. 
but people don't recognize that that is happening again. And it's happening again with the Chinese Communist Party in the mix. What do the party want? It, you know, BlackRock wants money. And certainly that's that's they're right. And Pfizer wants money and CBS wants money. But what does the Chinese Communist Party want? They want our system to look like theirs. That's their incentive. That's what they're putting into the system. So when we think about warfare in the Chinese Communist Party sense, it's political warfare. It's not the warfare that I, you know, as a B-2 pilot learned. It's a completely different type of warfare. And it just so happens that globalization and the Internet are extremely, you know, potent vectors for political warfare in the 21st century. Well, and I, I might add, you know, that, I think this sort of quintessential example of the CCP being successful and getting us to implement their way of doing things is these horrible, this horrible, horrible lockdown policy that we adopted in many, many Western countries, which was, you know, basically what, what the CCP did to try to combat the virus, you know, and with the knowledge that we had from, you know, very prominent epidemiologists and, and reports that were written on this, this could never actually control a respiratory virus. And we knew this, but somehow we basically got into following the CCP's way. And of course, you know, the CCP was very, very happy to have, if they were gonna destroy our economy, if we're, we're, we're very happy to see the West do that as well. So, you know, quick, quick question before I move on to a little bit to more kind of conventional warfare, because um, is strategic competitor or enemy? And why are we saying strategic competitor if not? Well, rather than you know having this debate in the United States about what we call China, why don't we just look at what the Chinese Communist Party calls America? They call us an enemy. And so whatever we you know think, we have to respect the fact that that's what they believe. They believe that liberal democracy is just completely concocted by the American people to destroy the Communist Party. They, that's what they say in document number nine. It's not the fact that, hey, our society is over 240 years old, and it was based on the fact that the people that came here were fleeing tyranny. And most people that do come to America are fleeing ty tyranny. And But no, it's something that we concocted. It's all you know just designed to destroy the Chinese Communist Party. And therefore, that those ideas, they have to be defeated. And they have to be defeated in the narrative space. In other words, we they need the chinese communist party needs americans on their own to decide that democracy that our republic in the way that it was um, fashioned is not actually the best way to live that it's much better if we have a system you know that's designed by china and so you mentioned the coronavirus because the implications of you know lockdowns and masks don't show up in any of the pandemic protocols prior to Wuhan. And then all of a sudden we adopt them. Why did we adopt them? Again, they came from Wuhan. They came from edict by Xi Jinping. So if, if, this, um, if this final war is really about globalization, the internet, and the fact that we've got this you know, uh, superpower involved with all our corporations and financial institutions, and possibly they could drive us toward a certain you know, set of policies well, all you have to do is look at coronavirus and you say it happened. It ha and it happened everywhere. You know, the only um, the only sane nation was Sweden. How how is it? And so I think what we ought to be looking at here is how was Sweden able to get through the noise and find true north? That is something that I think we need to study. You know, let's quickly switch gears here because I don't know we don't have that much time left. And you know. As we speak, hot off the presses, Xi Jinping is saying, accelerate the development of conventional warfare tools. Okay, what do you make of this? Well, I, so first of all, they're supporting Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And there's no doubt about it. And you, so we're sending resources to Ukraine and we're sending resources to Russia through China. And so they don't want Russia to lose. And in many ways, you know, as was noted in the clip, they want to make sure that America is distracted by other things, not China. So but they are arming for war. They are they're they're upping their budgets. They already have a massive array of weapons on their side of the Taiwan Strait. And, and so, you know, we just have to expect that that's going to come at some point. Um, Rob, as we finish up or General Spalding, you know, as we finish up, um, 
you mostly have been letting everybody know, letting the world know through your book, Stealth War and so forth, of all these different unconventional or asymmetric or unrestricted warfare methods, you know, to use the, to use the term of the two colonels. Um, what I want to understand is, um, what is the interplay of these two things? Because it seems like this conventional piece, right? You, you, you mentioned something a moment ago. You're saying that we're actually supporting Russia through China. Right. So here we have a conventional warfare, a conventional uh, uh, buildup of arms through funding through the U.S. because China is supporting Russia. That's presumably what you're arguing. But basically, they're still playing this mind game with us. So this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. Well, yeah, it certainly has to do with McCarthy's, uh, you know, Speaker McCarthy's visit to Taiwan. Right. You know, so we don't go to Taiwan because the Chinese Communist Party potentially can be mad. So they're shaping the battle space. Essentially, they're influencing our behavior pre-conflict. So all the things that that they are trying to do now is to make sure that we don't we don't even intervene. That you know, th essentially, they go in unopposed, other than for uh, Taiwan. So they're using the 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 same influence um, uh, uh, mechanisms to do that to basically slow our response as they are you know, while they're building the war machine that they're going to use. What's the strategic importance of Taiwan? A lot of people are still unclear on this. Well, how are we going to protect Japan and Korea and the Philippines? Taiwan is strategically oriented in the first island chain. And it really, it, it, and, you know, quite frankly, it's going to make, you know, the physical protection of our allies and partners in the region impossible. And I'm, the other part I'm thinking of is, you know, man, chip manufacturing. Well, I mean, that's critical to the U.S. technology. So, I mean, if we don't have an alternative to TSMC, who, by the way, makes the world most of the world's chips and most advanced chips, what, you know, what happens the day after? What happened the day after, you know, um, you know, Japan uh, bombed Pearl Harbor? We had a completely different relationship. So imagine all the companies that are going to be caught off guard if China's invaded Taiwan and we haven't done something about this. So. Uh, final question here. Um, in your mind right now, right, we do have these new congressional, uh, we have a new whole subcommittee focusing on the China threat. Um, the big question is, what is it that we should be doing now? And it seems like it's a big lift from where we are right now, from everything you've said. Economy, building our infrastructure, our manufacturing, understanding to protect our infrastructure in the United States, because they will attack our infrastructure as a means of keeping us distracted. So we have to rebuild America is the bottom line. All right. Well, General Spalding, it's great to speak with you. I'm going to uh, send it back over to you. Thank you. It's great to always uh, to talk to you, Jan.